Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We will continue with our next hymn, hymn 171, and as I believe we have no young children with us this morning, uh, we will sing all six verses.
Christ. Amen. Today we're going to talk about ruling. Who rules? And they rule. You ever feel like you rule? I remember when I was a kid, there was this ongoing debate in the schoolyard, who ruled? It was an understood concept that boys ruled and girls ruled. Of course, the other side of the playground had a different take on that. That was girls rule and boys rule. We never really came to a resolution on that. But I was seven, so don't hold that against me. We all thought we ruled, right? Um, part of me is still seven, though. When the score is almost tied up and I'm able to crush that winning serve, that ping pong ball over the head of my 11-year-old, I rule. It feels good to rule. That's seven, that's immature, right? I also find that I'm still seven a lot of times when I think that I am actually in control of my life. I am in control of what's before me. I rule. And then I find out that I'm not, that I'm actually not ruling. I'm not in control. But that's okay. It's okay in light of what we are celebrating today. And that is the fact that in all things, Jesus rules. He rules the spiritual. He rules the physical. He rules with absolute sovereignty. And sometimes... Sometimes he chooses to extend that rule and his blessings through us, through the people of this world. But it is he who rules. And that's why we can have confidence and certainty. And it's what he speaks about today in Ephesians chapter 1. I want to read that to you one more time. Paul writes, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This is God. Paul's prayer in this text is that we be brought to a deeper understanding of where we stand with God, of his glory, what that means for us. That Jesus rules, and that he rules all things. He rules the, the spiritual kingdoms of this world, the, the physical kingdoms of this world, and he does it with absolute sovereignty. Sometimes that's hard to see, right? I find that it's sometimes easier to see things when you look at it through perspective the perspective of history. And we're allowed to do that. We, we get the opportunity to do that as we look in the Old Testament and as we see God's hand at work in the lives of his people and in the lives uh, of this world. <coughs> One of the things we're going to look at today is what we read in Isaiah 14, and that was deep, which is why we're going to take a little closer look at that. As I mentioned, there was two fulfillments here, two things that this prophecy was talking about. The latter that I mentioned was that this was... His putting Satan in his place. Now, the Bible teaches that there was once, and I'm using this word very loosely, a rebellion. A rebellion in heaven, only in an academic sense. Satan, one of God's created angels, a spiritual being, given free will, tried to exercise that will and usurp God's authority. Wasn't content with what he had, with where he was, and so he tried to be God. I call it a rebellion in an academic sense because God has infinite power over all things and it was undoubtedly the shortest lived rebellion of, of history. Immediately cast down. There is only one God. God would not be questioned. God would not be second guessed. God would not be replaced. And so Satan and those who would follow him were cast out of heaven forever. And that caused him great anger, knowing what he would now suffer for eternity, and so he decided to go after God's people. To hurt God indirectly by going after his people. And he did so by tempting Adam and Eve with the same promise, you will be like God, they fell. But here is where God would still not have his power usurped. 
He promised Adam and Eve that he would give them forgiveness. Despite what they had done, they would remain his. He would bring somebody who would win them forgiveness and would win them an eternal place with God. Ever since that day, God has been defending his people. Now, how he did that, as history would go, is by setting aside a group of people, his nation, which would serve two purposes. This nation would revolve around all of God's promises. The nation of Israel, first established through Abraham. The nation of Israel would have all of God's promises. His promise of protection. His promise of forgiveness. The promise given not just in word, but in all the sacrifices. Every time a lamb was sacrificed, they would see the promise that God was going to punish somebody else for them. These promises would continually remind them that despite all of the problems of the world, they were God's, and God would not let them go. God would forgive them and was providing for them a future. But this nation would also serve as a light to the rest of the world. As the rest of the world looked at this nation and they saw the promises that this nation held on to, they would see that those promises applied to them as well. And even in the darkest times, they would be able to live in God's love and live with the confidence that this world wasn't in charge, nor were they in charge. God was in charge, and God had bought them back. That was the promise. God has been in charge of the spiritual world since the very beginning, and any attack against that spiritual kingdom, God has defended his people against and continues to defend his people against. And yet Satan continues to attack and eventually we get to the second part of our text in Isaiah, where now he speaks of Sennacherib. I'm going to give you the history behind this. God had established this kingdom, a kingdom that embraced his promises, that shared like a beacon his promises with the world. But Satan had gotten its hooks into this kingdom, into this nation, and the people began to forget their need for God and, and stop looking at God and began to put their confidence in the things of this world and the things of themselves. But God wouldn't let it go. And so God was prepared to do whatever it took to bring them back, to show them the need that they had for him, and, and ultimately to show them his love and forgiveness. And so he brought in Sennacherib. Now, here's where the working of God in, in, in life can sometimes seemed confusing. Sennacherib was an evil king. There was no godliness in him. What he did was not justified, was not good. And yet following his human nature, God allows him to do what he would want to do because he knew that he could bring about something good. What he allowed Sennacherib to do was to continue his march of conquest from the north to the south and eventually conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. It was an awful time for Israel. But recognize that what was most important for God was not the physical protection of his people, but the eternal, spiritual protection of his people. And so God controlled the physical world in order to wake them up, show them their need, show them that they were not in charge, but always holding before them that truth of forgiveness and that he was in charge and that he loved them, that even when they were taken off into captivity, he would continue to be with them. And I hope you see this, 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 this truth, that God, allowing this world to do what it will do when it serves his purpose, is in control. He is in absolute control of all things, only allowing to happen what he knows he can work with, but always for the spiritual good of his people. I'm going to throw a little more history at you. Because God doesn't just work at one point in history. He works through all history. About 150 years later. Same thing happened to the northern king, or the southern kingdom of Israel, known as Judah. They had held on to God a little bit longer. They had been that light to the world a little bit better. But they were starting to slip too. Satan was getting his claws into them too. And God wouldn't have it. And so he allowed another king to do what his sinful nature would do. He allowed the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, to come in and conquer Judah and take them off into captivity, promising them that he would bring them back. Because he was in control, he could do this. 
Well, what's fascinating is that during this captivity, the prophet Daniel, who was one of the captives in Babylon, about 500 to 600 B.C., was given this vision. Well, truth is, Nebuchadnezzar was given the vision. Daniel was given the understanding. It was a dream of a, of a, a statue, um, a four-portion statue, and, and I'll, give you, I'll make this very short. It was a prophecy about four coming kingdoms. All four kingdoms would have their purpose, would serve their place. God would use each one of these four kingdoms to serve his purpose. But during the decline of that fourth kingdom, he would establish a kingdom that would have dominance, eternal dominance over all things. He would lay the foundation for his eternal kingdom that would rule spiritually and physically. And as we look at history, we see that this prophecy played out in perfection. That first king... Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was later replaced by the king of Persia, later replaced by the king of Greece, later replaced by the nation of, of, of uh, Rome. And even in our meager intellect, we can see a little bit of God's purpose. God had raised up Babylon for one specific purpose, to be that instrument by which he would rebuke and wake up his people of Judah by taking them into captivity. When that purpose was served, then he allowed Babylon to fall and Persia to rise for one purpose. Under Persia, under King Darius, Judah was allowed to return. And under the protection of this powerful nation of Persia, Judah was allowed to rebuild. Once again, becoming that beacon to the world by which all people could look and see and hear the promises of God. Once that had been accomplished, Persia fell and was replaced by Greece. You may have seen the movies, heard the stories, the Peloponnesian War, how this mighty city-states of Greece combined to, to overcome Xerxes and the terrible Persian Empire. Who put that plan together? It wasn't the Greek generals. This was God's hand working all these things. And under Greece... Under Alexander, God, God accomplished something else very great. The Greek Empire spread over all the world at that time, the known world, and brought about something new. It brought about a unified culture, a language that even though it might not have been your dominant language, people could communicate. You know, in, in a similar way, it, it's like the internet. Just track me on this. The internet has made our world so much smaller, hasn't it? Communicating with people all over the world. Like it, don't like it, it doesn't matter. The point is, we have been brought closer together. That's what Greece did on a much more archaic level. But now people could communicate. Now people could relate to one another. And when that was accomplished, Greece fell to Rome which established for the first time in history a common rule, a road system by which people could, could, could travel safely in an empire in which people could and did move about the world. Now, so what? It's history. But if you look at what God was trying to accomplish, it was at the fall of the Roman Empire, during the decline of the Roman Empire, that God sent Jesus into the world. The one who would establish this permanent kingdom with his birth, with his life lived so that we could get every credit for every good deed, and then his death in which he took the blame for every misstep, every mistake, every wicked thought, word, and deed of us. He took it away and brought us back to God. And he did it at a time when this message with a common tongue, with an intricate system of travel and communication could be spread to the world. I hope you can see how God has used the kingdoms of this world to serve his greatest desire, that people would see his salvation, that what Christ had done could reach the ends of the world, the world, the earth. And it has, and it is. And then Christ ascended, and what we see today is that he is still in control of all things. Sometimes it's easy to see it from perspective. 
But has things changed? Have things changed? You know, God, God ruled the physical world in such a way to prepare for Jesus coming into this world. And Jesus has promised that he's coming again. And that until he comes again, he is preparing. He's preparing a place for us. More, like, more, more to the point, he is preparing us for this place, preparing this world for this place. And he is still guiding the things of this world for that purpose. Which to me is incredibly comforting because I tend to watch the news. And I look around and I see, you know, who's, in, who's really in control? Well, it depends on what side of the playground you're on. But that's childish thinking. And God is the one who's in control. And, and, and we, we might not see it now, but someday we will see how he has guided the nations of this world to serve this purpose. You know, establishing systems of communication, 